Yeah, it says it's now streaming live on YouTube. Yeah. Message. Meeting on YouTube. Okay, we're live. Yeah, it says it's now streaming live on YouTube. Yeah. Um, yeah. We're live now on. How do I share this? Copy and here's the link to today's seminar on Aglaya by Dr. Primavera. So we're live on YouTube. So um, how can we share this? I've shared the link, so people should go to that link and watch the seminar on using that link. Yeah, it seems to work, Jasper. So um, yeah. let's just get started. Okay. Yep. Okay, so let's get started now. So I hope people will be able to see that. All right. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another Coast Digital Floor of the Philippines. So this is our 13th um, Zoominar in this series. And uh, we apologize for our late start because of some technical difficulty with Facebook. So right now we are live streaming on YouTube. So I hope you can find the link that we posted on Coast Digital Flora. Um, and that would, uh, that would allow you to watch this live stream. So it's a YouTube link and we're not live streaming uh, on Facebook because Facebook is, um, it's not cooperating with us at the moment. Anyway, we are fortunate today because we have um, with us uh, a very um, well-known um, scientist in her field. We have Dr. Jurgen Primavera to share with us her work on Aglaya. So I will introduce uh, our speaker today and then um, she can have the floor. And after the talk, um, as usual, um, if you have questions, just post them on the chat box or on Facebook, you can post it on the comment section. Right, okay, so let me introduce to you our uh, speaker for today. So our speaker is uh, Dr. Jurgen Primavera. She has a zoology and marine science degrees from the University of the Philippines and Indiana University. Uh, she taught at the Mindanao State University and had a job with the CFDEC Aquaculture Department. She was conferred uh, a PhD in science honor honoris causa by Stockholm Univer University because of her work on mangrove uh, pinnate shrimp aquaculture. Uh, Dr. Primavera has led or co-authored 100, around 140 scientific papers, reviews, manuals, books, and other publications on aquaculture, fisheries, and mangroves um, including papers in science and nature and the plant books, Handbook of Mangroves in the Philippines, Panay in 2004, and Beach Forest and Mangrove Associates in the Philippines in 2012. She has been named Scientist Emerita of CIFDEC in 2000, um, CIFDEC, and in 2008, um, she was a, a Time Magazine Hero of the Environment. Um, she's also a UP Distinguished Alumni in Environmental Conservation and Academician of the National Academy of Science and Technology. So presently, Dr. Jurgen is, uh, is the Chief Mangrove Scientific Advisor of the Zoological Society of London, 
and she uh, in her spare uh, spare time she spent tending to a home nursery and restoring two Iloilo mini forests of native trees. So without further ado, um, I'll turn over now uh, the floor to our speaker for this afternoon, Dr. Jurgen Primavera. And gosh. Uh, good afternoon to all. Is this is it okay, Jasper? Yes. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> first of all, thanks to Jasper and to Peter for the invitation to share uh, the story of Aglaya Argentea. I'll speak a little bit about taxonomy and distribution with a bit of history, then wild populations and plantings. So, first distribution, the species is found, these are uh, records from East Asia and the Nicobars through Southeast Asia, uh, Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia, Philippines, on to New Guinea, the Solomon Islands and Northern Australia. And in the Philippines, it's found in the major islands in Cagayan, Luzon, Nueva Ecija, Pampanga, Laguna, Sorsogon. Then, I'm sorry the stars are not aligning, but anyway, uh, the text is here. Down to the Visayas in Panay, we have Capis and Iloilo. The red uh, stars mean that these are these were just documented this year. I mean, personal observations. And then Cebu and Leyte, again red stars in Misamis and uh, Davao. Then Cotabato and Basilan. So with such a widespread distribution, we ask the question: Why was Melia Iloilo, that was the first name, named after Iloilo, and not? Aglaya Cebu or Aglaya Laguna? So to answer that question, uh, let's have a bit of history. This guy is um, Miguel Lopez de Legazpi. He led the third Spanish expedition. And the first was, of course, Magellan, who met his death. The second, uh, Villalobos, a short-lived one. And this is the third. He arrived summer 1565, had a blood compact in Bohol, those of you who remember your history, and established the first Spanish outpost in Cebu. And in 69, after four years, established a settlement in Panay. So among the so many islands in the Philippines, we can see that Panay was among the first where the Spanish uh, settled. So that maybe could be linked with why the species was named after Ililo. But anyway, um, by 1571, uh, the Spanish invaded Manila and uh, defeated the Muslims, Raja Suleiman. So you might ask, why did they have to go to Manila? And now this is, if you will indulge me in a bit of history, after all this two, two and a half centuries, uh, the next slide. Uh, the team had a sort of a spy, Martin Goiti, who went around and reported that around Manila Bay was a thriving population of Indios, a lot of uh, people, a lot of forests for timber, and a lot of uh, rice fields for food. Because actually, the purpose of the Spanish expeditions was for Spain to rule commerce. It was uh, mercantile. And this brings us to the story of the Manila galleons, uh, two and a half centuries from 1565 to 18 something when the Mexican War broke out and that ended it. Around 110 galleons uh, altogether, but most of them were made in the Philippines. So can you imagine the requirements for such 100 uh, galleons over two and a half centuries? 
So here it's called the China ship because actually most of the goods going from the east, from the Orient to the west, uh, what they call New Spain in Mexico, were from China. The um, ceramics, uh, perfumes, uh, precious stones, and so on, and also from Moluccas, the spices, and other parts of Southeast Asia. And Manila was just a transshipment place, actually. So this was called the China ship. Goods from the east to the west, and then from the west was money. The silver of the Spanish from, from its colonies in the Americas, no? that's the Mexican peso. And this nice um, sketch here shows, they, they were called the Naos de China, that was the Spanish uh, term. And here we see a lot of wood because one galleon could accommodate a thousand passengers. Wow. So that's a lot of wood. And if you look at here, this is from an unpublished uh, University of Hawaii PhD thesis. The species used Calophyllum inophyllum, Incha bijuga, and Pitex parviflora. I named the scientific names because these are beach forest species. Then Terminalia microcarpa, and two uh, Dipterocarps, and Lawaan, Banaba, and Dumon. Uh, lowland forest species. And the estimate was that at least 2,000 trees were required per um, galleon. So if you compute uh, 100 galleons over two and a half centuries, that gives you 200,000 trees. And if you estimate, let's say, 100 trees per hectare, that would give you 2,000 hectares uh, cleared. Uh, all over, well, mainly in the Manila area near Cavite, where the shipyards were. But still, considering uh, 2,000 hectares in the context of 30 million hectares of forest, which we had at that time, not really too much because they were using carabaos. No, there was no mechanized transport at the time. This was carabao logging. Then, oh, by the way, uh, starting at 500 tons, uh, by the end of, by 1865, it had reached uh, 3,000 tons. So these were successful initiatives, you know, very, uh, um, uh, what you call, very profitable. So they got bigger and bigger. And here, if you look at the sails made of uh, cloth from Ilocos, and the riggings and ropes and ladders made from abaca, or Philippine hemp, but also... In 1642, the Spanish governor general required each native, its Indio or Filipino, to plant 200 coconuts for rigging, caulking materials, and also for food and water for the return trip. So actually, that was the start of the coconut uh, monoculture plantations because Cocos nocifera is only one of many beach forest species, but this goes back to the Spanish time. And if you note, here is a friar because they had positions of prestige and power uh, at the time. No? So later we will see. And here's the route. From Manila to Acapulco took all of eight months because it was so difficult. And this brought all the goods from the east to Mexico. But from Acapulco to Manila was only three months. And this journey introduced all the plants that we know now, no? the fruits, the, uh, what we have in our kitchens, uh, sugarcane, piña, papaya, even the uh, ampalaya or camote and so on. So there's a slim volume, Flora Filipina, that shows nice uh, sketches of these species. But my hidden agenda really for this slide is to invite if there are any uh, botany uh, grad students to do a thesis, you know, a detailed thesis on the galleon trade and the botanical aspects because that's two and a half centuries. So a lot of things happen. And of course, there's even one species that's locally called Acapulco, 
Sena Alata and very clear. You don't have to do any research to guess where it came from. It's a, it's a pest, actually. It goes anywhere. So we come to the taxonomy of Glaya. Here we have down to the species. And this was first described in 1837, first edition of Flora de Filipinas, which says Melia Iluilo, hojas, leaves, hojuelas, leaflets. And this tree, they can grow up to 30 meters with the trunk remaining unbranched, as we see here. And diameter of more than half a meter, but buttresses up to one meter. So that one, I'm quite, you know, I have a question on the buttresses because this is a large tree and there's no sign of a buttress. And here's Father Blanco, because in the Philippines, the first scientists were the friars. And he was known as the Prince of Botanists, writing Flora de Filipinas, which identified 1,200, I guess, kinds would mean species of plants in the Philippines. I'm sure uh, most of you are familiar with that volume. So 1837, described as Melia Iluilo, but Meryl uh, revised that to Aglaya Iluilo. But then somebody standardized it to Aglaya Argentea because in 1825, earlier than these two dates, the species had already been described <clears throat> by Bloom. So the leaves are compound and quite huge, no? a meter long with two to four pairs of leaflets and a terminal leaflet. And the leaves are glossy green above, but with scales. Uh, white to brown, white and brown scales, so that if more white, then it would give a silvery appearance, like here, hence the species epithet Argentea. Or if more brown, then you would have the coppery shades like this. Uh, actually, in Iloilo, in Panay, I saw mostly this, uh, more of brown or even gold. Fruits and flowers at four. 0.5 meters tall, that's quite young. So that's an indication of uh, early reproduction of a pioneer. Because that's, if they go up to 30 meters and they reproduce as small as five meters, wow. And flowers, inflorescence, and the fruits have a sweet or sweet soft aril eaten by children. And I can imagine fruit, uh, fruits eaten by birds and bats as well, which would mean dispersal. So we go now to the, of course, these were all from the internet. Okay, this one says Aglaya Iluilo and is in the U.S. National Museum, uh, the Herbarium. And it gives here the original name of Melia Iluilo. Okay, the next one, this time specifies it came from the Bureau of Science, Flora of the Philippines, to the U.S. Museum, to the U.S. Herbarium. Here it's called Aglaya Bicolor. And another one, this one again, from the Bureau of Science Herbarium, to the U.S. Museum, to the U.S. Herbarium. And if you note, here we see a CM panel and CM panel, and indeed his name comes up in the literature. Maybe it's the one who standardized the names. Uh, I'm not really sure. But if we were to read this clearly, this specimen came from Mount Makiling in 1915. Uh, this one even earlier from Zamboanga in 1908. So the Spanish were all over the islands, actually. And the plant also was all over the islands. And this one has no date nor provenance, or at least I cannot read it. But what's interesting is that it comes from a forest at an altitude of 150 meters. Okay, Also, also from the Bureau of Science. So Aglaya Argentea has eight synonyms, some of which we see here. Aglaya multifololia, this one, and Aglaya bicolor this one, but all 
uh, now standardized to Aglaya Argentea. So to the distribution on um, the lowland rainforest, and it is fairly common. So this was really widespread, scattered in these uh, forests, also in peat swamp. But surprisingly, one references to 150 meters, but another says up to 1,200, which is really one order of magnitude uh, different. So what's going on here? For that, we look at some more specimens, but this time from the Solomon Islands. Oh, Panel again shows up here and here. But anyway, for our question, five to 10 feet above sea level, and this is 400 feet, that's 100 meters only above sea level, more consistent with the lower elevation. And Rojo in the lexicon has the 1,200 meters. Looking at his references, he has the original one, 1825, and Panel, 1995. So this one must have come from either and has been repeated you know, in the literature. But I do not see this in, in the specimens. So we go to the place where uh, that big Aglaya was found. This is the protected landscape seascape in Misamis, in Itau, Libertad, here, that's the sea. So the elevation is only 10 meters, uh, very clearly, uh, even a beach forest, you might say. And it's just a simple uh, sketch of different forests, which I use all the time because it shows the beach forest here. And I would imagine uh, Aglaya would be here to, to, to the lowland forest. And talking about beach forest species, most Philippine place names after plants are beach forest species. Not the dipterocarps, not the mangroves, not what other trees, but the beach forest trees for the simple reason that the early Filipinos settled along the water where they had transport you know, for transport. So along the water would be along the coastline where they would see Barintonia asiatica, Calufilum, Cycas, Erythrina, Incha, that's Ipil, uh, Pandanus, of course, Terminalia, which is beloved of so many Filipino towns. You have dozens of barangays named Talisay and our Molave. So here we have Melia Iluilo to Aglaya Iluilo, and we look now at the timeline in terms of its return to Iluilo. So in 2016, Imelda Sarmiento, who is the lead editor of the series of Philippine Native Trees, uh, 101, 202, and 203, was speaking before a group of Iluilo native enthusiasts. And she showed this. She said, have you seen this Iluilo tree? <laughs> because uh, she was in Iluilo, and they were mostly Ilongos. And of course, they said, what? Nobody knew a thing about the Iluilo tree. And that was that. Nothing happened after that. It was forgotten in Iluilo and elsewhere. Until two years later, Sel Tungul, the lead photographer for at least the first two of these books, somehow found herself in Mindanao, in Misamis, walking around this protected landscape and saw the Iluilo tree and posted photos on social media, which spurred nationwide awareness of the tree. So there is this tree. The next year, another social media post of Aglaya in Capiz, so that's in Panay, uh, generated excitement so that the next month, uh, the Capiz local government organized a trip to look for the species. And the next year, finally, Aglaya Argentea was found in Iloilo. So after all, it is the Iloilo tree and not the Initao tree as we were joking or the Capiz tree. So it is in Iloilo. So talking about wildings, this was, I have a friend in Mindanao, so I asked him to look for wildlings with Paso um, 
permission, of course. It's a protected area. And after a few months of nursing them, we met at the Cagayan de Oro Airport just to exchange, just to get the wildlings here with all the permits. And from 21, they are now down to five, but they're sturdy and maybe ready for outplanting uh, next year, five Aglaya Argentea. Still wildlings, this was now in Iloilo. Uh, just a few months ago, uh, the local government uh, looked at many wildlings. No? So you can imagine birds or bats you know, dispersing the fruits here. So they're, they're there. And also in Dabao, it has been see, seen near the, in a, on a rocky cliff. So this one has been kept for some time in the nursery. But I'd like to show this one, one of those from Davao, because this is an arboretum owned by the local government of Nabunturan. Imagine a local government with an arboretum for native trees, which is much more than you can say for our national agencies. Anyway, this is with the initiative of the vice mayor, who's really um, an enthusiast. So back to Capiz, another commendable local government official, the Penro Attorney Abeb of Capiz, uh, organized a trip in August 2019 to Hamindan, okay, to look for this. And indeed, we saw a lot of wildlings here, but no mother trees. Maybe we had only three hours, except for the sapling that we saw in our three hours. And we had the staff of the Penro and some students and the locals. And it's really such a joy to be out in the field. You know, I have many field photos, but just one. I allowed myself just one. And uh, it's so nice if your Penros, you know, have this very positive outlook uh, towards doing field work. Uh, the best part of this is that first we had a meeting with the barangay officials and with the local communities, the POs, People's Organizations, protecting the forest. Hamindan is a protected forest. And this is really our goal for environmental conservation in the Philippines is when all the stakeholders, not just the officials in Manila, in Quezon City, but the local stakeholders, the communities, the officials, and the provincial officers own, own the resource and will protect it. And that is Hamindan, where the Aglaya Argentea was first seen in Panay. So those wildings from Hamindan, this year, that's the provincial governor of Capiz, had 100 of them collected for donation to the governor of Iloilo, that is Arthur Defensor Jr. Okay? Some of them have been outplanted already. But two years ago, the father of the present governor, that's Arthur Defensor Sr., was renovating the capital grounds. So quickly, uh, a group of us went to see him and asked if we could have some native trees on the grounds during the renovation. And he said, sure. So we put, up, uh, we put together a proposal and had a budget of 31,000 for the native seedlings and uh, a little bit more for the logistics, transport, and so on. In July, we submitted it. And these were the species, the common scientific names, description, and even the price. And here we have Aglaya argentea, the Iluilu tree, supposed to be to have pride of place here. And this is the space for the native trees. But as of October, there was no response, absolutely, from the local government. So somebody said, why don't you have a petition in Change.org, which we did, to plant the Iluilu tree, addressed to Governor Defensor and to the architect, but still no response. I think we had 400 signatories there. So in April 2018, I already had the tree ready for, from Manila, sourced from Manila. You can see that's in the airport and the permit ready for planting, but then the local government had no response. So it was growing tall in the nursery of one of our members. We approached the priests in Ateneo and they were just too willing to plant that tree 
on Valentine's Day, 14 February 2019. So the priest officers and their students on that day. So the plantings include the priests in a university, in a school, then a hospital before the local government relented and asked again if I had uh, some seedlings. So these are the doctors in August planting the tree. Here, that's the facade, um, hopefully to replace the Indian, exotic Indian trees when it grows. In February, height of summer, which we will also see with the provincial capital. So I had to source again in 2019 because the provincial government already contacted me for an Iloilo tree. So one of my trips to Manila, I got another one here and asked that the signage be prepared, planted by, usually it's the politicians. So indeed we had Senator Drillon and governors and mayors, but I specified that the tree carers, and that is Imelda, because this came from Imelda Sarmiento. And myself should also be there because we take care of this for what? One, two, three years, and they plant for 10 minutes, 20 minutes. Uh, but we see this often enough. So anyway, see this? In February, the height of summer, you see the leaves uh, crispy, despite all the watering and when the rains came. So quite fast growth rate and indeed a few references say that it has potential use as a pioneer species. So that the growth rate plus the early reproduction. So more plantings, uh, this is now the last part of my talk. Uh, one, uh, four years ago in Batad, but Typhoon Ursula uh, uprooted it, so that's gone. But in my own, um, call it a tree garden in 2018 and uh, last January looking very good and this is my I don't call it a tree farm because I do not farm trees here so maybe garden is better uh, biodiversity but it brings us to the ecological debate should we plant trees or let forests regrow okay you look at the literature on conservation and you have that so to address this, I go to one of our project sites of Zoological Society of London in Leganes, Iloilo, an abandoned pond to the left, about nine hectares, where we actively planted mangrove wildlings available nearby using assisted natural regeneration. And in three years, we had complete cover. We had covered the almost 10 hectares with mangroves. In contrast, no intervention here, just simple natural re regeneration. And this would take 15 to 20 years. I've seen many ponds all over the Philippines. 15 to 20 years, it comes back. In the meantime, each year we have 20 typhoons. So do the arithmetic, 20 times 20, you have 400 typhoons during which you do not have coastal protection. So this is what I tell my um, Friends in the West, when they say, do not touch that nature, you know, do its thing. I said, it's a luxury of time we cannot afford in the Philippines. So I think it should be plant trees and or let forests regrow. So plant, active planting where the conditions are right. Uh, it has been also called ex situ conservation. At the same time, protect the remaining forests. So uh, the last three slides, uh, this is my nursery uh, because when we wrote the book that Jasper mentioned, uh, we had plenty of seeds, so I planted them. And from the nursery, they have been outplanted. Uh, by this time, 80 species, a total of 80 species, mostly beach forest. In 2016, I took stock. Uh, I had planted about 60 species by that time. The beach forest species had almost 90% survival. The non-beach species, including dipterocarps, had less than 20% survival. 
So this is really for the national breeding program. You use beach forest species because this is, you know, the most extreme environment is in Iloilo. If it can survive in Iloilo, then it will survive. And the number one species I recommend is Miletia pinata. This is how our book look with the seeds. So after we measured the seeds, I sold them in my nursery, the seedlings. So that's the P generation. This is the first filial generation outplanted. And it produced the second filial F2, the grandchildren. So in four years, you have what? The parents, the children, and the grandchildren. Very early reproduction is what you need for uh, quick and effective reforestation. It's the opposite of the Filipino population. <laughs> you want late reproduction for Filipinos. So we do not, you know, now we are, our population is really run away. But for trees, we need the early reproduction. And that tree is now like this in 2020, just huge producing seeds, I think for the last five years, which I have distributed to our groups all over. And by the way, I'm not worried about uh, this because beach forests, you know, they are found in almost all the islands. There's no endemicity because of the tidal dispersal. So this is found in all the islands that we sampled, uh, Miletia pinata. And all I ask from the people I send the seeds to are to send me back if they sprout the baby photos so that I make a family album. I have this for, I don't know, maybe um, 10 species now, 15. And may I end with this a drone photo from Capis of the Hamindan forest, you know, where we went and where I would like to go and really look for the mother tree of Aglaya Argentea. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. George, and that was a very interesting talk and um, an interesting um, history about um, Aglaya Argentea. So we go now to questions uh, for Dr. George about her interesting talk. So how do we go about this, Peter? So do you have, so, you, so you're looking at Facebook and do you see any questions there posted, Peter? Yeah, but looking at Facebook, um, nothing, uh, nothing quite yet. Mm -hmm. um, I, I have a question, though, if mm -hmm. I may. <laughs> yes, you are. Uh, you may. Dr. Primavera, that was a very, very interesting uh, presentation. And once more, I'm so incredibly impressed by the volume of work that you have been doing over the years. It's just amazing. And you seem to be going everywhere, planting everywhere. Um, a very, very impressive. So my question is about um, recognizing um, Aglaya Argentea. Um, I'm not too familiar with Aglaya's myself. Um, so I've, I've been looking at the Flora Milesiana treatment of the family and of, of Aglaya specifically. And it's, it does seem that there are a few uh, native Philippine species that can look quite similar to um, Aglaya Argentea. Um, do you know anything about what the easiest characters are to really be sure that you have Aglaya Argentea as opposed to um, something else? Um, <clears throat> well, maybe I've seen enough uh, Iluilu trees to get a sense because that was one of my slides actually. I had a slide with other Aglaya species, Aglaya eximia and Aglaya uh, see, something, something. And they have these big compound leaves. When you see these leaves, you know, uh, you get the sense that's a glaya. And um, a really nice looking. So, Peter, I'm not a botanist. So, uh, uh, this is my cue to uh, excuse myself. But um, that's, that's really uh, the purpose of this talk is to, to challenge uh, the younger generation maybe to, to look into this because, wow, our biodiversity is just so fantastic. And to imagine that in 2016, nobody knew about Aglaya Argentea, about the Iluilu Ilu Ilu tree in the whole of Iluilu. <laughs> Not one Ilongo knew about it. So, uh, yes, um, 
that's all I can say. I'm sorry. I should, you know, mention all these botanical terms, but uh, I have a good excuse. I'm a zoologist, so uh, maybe uh, other uh, botanists in the group can can really look at them. But but when you've seen enough um, Aglaya argentea, you'll know Aglaya because I had a photo actually going back to 2000 of uh, plant in Aklan. And I have many of these uh, photographs of unidentified species, you know, those that I post every now and then, they're nothing compared to what I have. So when I started collecting the Aglaya argentea, I said, wait a minute, this looks similar. So I went back and forth and that was Aglaya eximia looking at them. So, so they're, they're there and um, I'm sorry, I cannot be more uh, helpful uh, with your question. Yeah. Oh, no, not, not at all. Um, I'm just, just curious because I find identifying a glia is always quite difficult. And one time I was in a meeting and uh, there was a, 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 a lunch and I was sitting next to a lady and we started talking about Miliaceae. And I started complaining about how difficult it is to identify a glias. And then um, this person kind of played along a little bit, I found out, because it turned out I was talking to Caroline Panel the one who wrote the Flora Malaysiana revision uh, oh. and, and, and wrote the key for Aglaya. And we go, I was complaining about how in the key you have to look at all these different hair types. And you have peltate scales underneath the leaf or stellate hairs. And you need to measure the sizes and how far these hairs are from each other. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> she was kind enough to let me you know, express myself. And then um, <laughs> she took me to the herbarium and we had a good afternoon of looking at uh, herbarium specimens of Aglaia together. And some things be did become a little bit more clear, but I don't think I've ever really looked at the Aglaia argentea and Ar Aglaia eximia group. So that was where my question came from. So thank you. So, so, so that's the panel in those uh, museum uh, specimens, CM yes. panel. So, yeah. so she's and not she's, old uh, lady. The, what, what, <laughs> Sorry, one of the things that uh, that was really nice um, meeting with her is that she was, um, when I talked to her about plant photography, she said first, well, you cannot identify aglias from photographs because you really need to see the hair types. So then I kind of challenged her a little bit and I showed her lots of photos that we have on CDFP. And she got really excited because by seeing the photos, she saw all kinds of characters that you no longer see in um, herbarium specimens. And that's confirmed some of her ideas about subgroups within particular aglia groups, um, species that she thought might be similar uh, on the basis of other characters, but she wasn't really quite sure about it. So she was really um, interested in kind of the color and the texture of the arrow that surrounds the fruit. Um, so that was, was quite fun that she kind of acknowledged in the end that these plant photographs are, are, are pretty helpful. Uh, actually, Peter, it's good that you brought that up because you know there are the, I don't know what you call them, the purists who insist on the specimens alone, et cetera. But there, there's something that the live specimens capture, you know, uh, that, that, that jump at you when you see them. And so, so a combination of both, I guess, yeah. But she did mention the aerial, so I, oh, I, I would like to to, to see a, a fruit and taste it, you know, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yeah. Jesper, you got any questions there? Um, no questions um, yet. Oh, there's, uh, just now, there's uh, one question that uh, just popped up. So it's from Jiro or Hero Manulat. Um, so, so the question was, I would like to ask what mangrove species are most appropriate in replanting abandoned fish, fish ponds within landward regions? Uh, it's a mangrove question. Not, uh, yeah, it's not, anyway, not, yeah. <laughs> nothing to do with Aglaia, yeah, but you know. yeah, I'm very comfortable with that. Um, you know, all things being equal, your best bet is Avicenia marina, Miapi, Piapi, uh, Bungalon, because that's the most widespread um, species of mangroves. It's the number one colonizer. But then uh, if you 
get a few other um, uh, information about the substrate, where exactly how landward it is, how close to the river, and so on. Then you might look at other species, um, look at what the remaining species are around. But I think you would be safe with Avicenia marina. And to a certain extent, um, oh no, not Sonaratia. Sonaratia is definitely, uh, it likes the open sea, it likes to face the sea. And Rhizophora, what we are most familiar with, would be along tidal rivers and creeks. So the short answer is Avicenia marina. Right, to be safe. I have a question um, uh, from me again, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> um, uh, about bringing it, the discussion back to Aglaya and well, actually a little bit and then away from Aglaya because now you've kind of successfully reintroduced um, Aglaya argentea in Iloilo. Are there any other plants named after Iloilo? And if so, I'm not, I kind of forgot if you mentioned in this presentation, but if so, are you planning to bring, bring those back and cultivate, a, cultivate them in Iloilo as well? Uh, Peter, you, your question is other plants? Yeah, are there, are there other plants in the Philippines also named after Iloilo? Oh, okay. As far as I know, no, because you know the native PNT, the Philippine Native Tree Enthusiast Group um, is now there's so many um, daughter groups that they ask, you know, are there native species named after our province or our island? So in the case of here, it's Panay. Uh, there are at least two species, I think, with Panayense. There's a Sisigium Panayense and there's one other Panayense that I forget. So, uh, but that one, those species, uh, they're, they're thriving. Uh, Sisigium Panayense is a beautiful, beautiful tree in Antique. And the other Panayense, I forget. So, they are thriving, except that people don't know. Actually, what we have to bring back is the awareness of people about the, the local flora. Yeah. So, yeah, the awareness, I think. And that would be through uh, education, through... Uh, by the way, uh, this, if I may be allowed to have some sales talk, I'm a trustee, an outgoing trustee of FPE. Foundation for Philippine Environment, but actually it's not FP. It's um, I mix up. It's a uh, Forest Foundation of the Philippines has three kinds of scholarships. It's offering three kinds of scholarships. One is for research on native Peri Ong fellowships, actually, um, in honor of the late Peri Ong, who was the UP Science Dean, uh, a very uh, conservationist. So one for research, one for advocacy, and one for art, because he also did um, some artwork, some poetry. So, you know, um, artwork in connection with native uh, flora. So that, that would be one way to, you know, to generate uh, interest in, in among the young. I think we have to target the younger generation because course you know the world is theirs uh, not 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 the older people uh, i think uh, they're hopeless so um yeah uh so that's why peter if i may throw a question to you, you i asked you already uh, about the cindy fp uh, what's what are your sustainability plans uh i'm sure you will be good for another 20 to 30 years but after that you know uh, <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, I know it's a difficult question to answer, you know. <laughs> there are some sustainability plans, and the, but the, the, the best plan is to have everything open in the, in the public domain so that if, you know, the worst thing happens, at least um, people don't need to start from scratch. There's nothing hidden here. What you see is what you get. Anybody can download the text on those uh, websites and do their thing. When it comes to the photographs, um, Phyto Images is being moved to um, Cornell University, oh. and it's a, a data set now of photographs that would be 
uh, kept there, um, or they at least committed to look after that in perpetuity. So that's good. Um, mm -hmm. But of course, I think for me, the most critical thing is, as you mentioned earlier, the contingency plan needs to be the next generation. We need to have enough people who are trained and keen to pick up the work because this is not a dead collection of data and photographs. Every single day I spend at least an hour or so, um, often more, simply to keep the database up to date uh, so that it's, it remains to be valuable. So yeah, the contingency plan, it's a multi-pronged strategy. And um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not claiming here that it's the contingency plan could not be improved. Uh, we do have enough uh, NGOs, uh, Forest Foundation of the Philippines, uh, Foundation for Philippine Environment, that would have some financial resources that maybe could be, uh, you know, set in that direction towards, uh, because this is also an important part of conservation. So I, I don't know exactly how, but um, you would need some resources to, to encourage, you know, young people. And if um, scholarship comes with it, uh, that could be useful to this person uh, to go into whatever you call it, taxonomy or what, what the term is for, for what you're doing. Then that would be there would be the motivation and there would be the uh, the backup the financial backup and it should happen while you're still there <laughs> so there will be you know uh, the yeah the uh, overlap you know, it's important to have overlap because yeah, there's thank so many you so much for the suggestion I, I <laughs> might just email about you about um, about that privately. Um, to, to explore some, some ideas that we might have that could, could align with that quite nicely. Um, because I completely agree with your, your vision here, that it is about kind of mentorship and, and, and creating opportunities for people to, um, to grow and to become enthusiastic, to build the skills. Um, and um, yeah, scholarships are excellent vehicles for that, for sure. Yes. Sure. Um, let's see All if right. there are any other questions. I still don't have anything from Facebook. I think Facebook's sleeping. Um, mm, yeah, and, and about maybe, uh, our viewers on, uh, on, on, on Zoom. Zoom, anyone who wants to ask a question, um, you can ask it in person or you can type. Oh, here we have a question from Moomin. Mm. Moomin is asking, uh, does Aglaia argentia have any medicinal properties? Oh, uh, I think I, my memory is not so good, you know, because I just um, very quickly went over that. But I think there, there was some mention of uh, maybe, uh, okay, let me put it this way. In the old times, there were no boutiques or pharmacies, you know, for, for dispensing medicine. So people would go to the outside, to the forest. And since most people were near the beach forest, because that's where the Filipinos settled, then most of these medicines, um, botanicals, would be from the beach forest. And since uh, Aglaia, Aglaia is, um, well, straddles the beach to the lowland forest, it would be, uh, my, my, I don't know, Peter, and just for, correct me if I'm wrong, but whenever I see a plant, I just assume that it has something. It has some chemical defense because, you know, not like us, they cannot fight or flee. So they, have, they just stand there. So they need mostly chemical defenses. So it's really the challenge is to find out what, what do they have that, that helps them. So to that question, without really remembering the details of the literature, I would say yes. Yeah. yeah. That is something to explore. <laughs> yeah, it kind of reminds me of something that um, our forest guides sometimes tell us, well, we come ag across Aglaia fruits and we start eating them. They always <laughs> tell us, well, you can eat a few, but you cannot eat that many of them. Otherwise, they'll, mm -hmm. they'll make your tummy upset. Um, so, um, Doc Primavera, from your own experience, how many Aglaia fruits can one eat in one sitting? Wow. Uh, that one, you know, of 
course, it depends a person like you, Peter, oh, tall and big. You have more than a person like me, uh, small with, uh, uh, smaller. But uh, I tell you, there's something to that because you know durian. Durian, mm. no? Yeah. Uh, I know. I have the, the, the guide line really is you don't eat more than once a day. So, of course, whenever I go home to Mindanao, and I just, I, I, I'm very good at following that. But there was once I forgot. I had it for lunch. <laughs> and then somebody had something for dinner and I had it for dinner. <laughs> and then the next day, I woke up with a splitting headache. I had high blood pressure. And I'm a low blood pressure person. So, I just had too much, too rich, whatever durian has. Yeah. So, that, you know, your the forest guides, they, they have all the wisdom <laughs> in the yeah. world. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, they know. Yeah. Um, we have another question from uh, Jiro. Um, is Aglaya potentially good as timber? Okay. Uh, just in general, from my acquaintance with beech forest species, especially the the fast growing ones, you know, the albicias and the um, uh, what what do you have? The Astonia. Uh, uh, the Dita uh, with uh, Scolaris. Yeah. Fast growers have soft wood. Uh, they do not invest in, you know, in putting whatever investment. They do, they do not invest time in making the hardwood because, well, they have they want to be something else. They want to shoot up, and they're pioneers. And Aglaya is like that. Okay, it's it's a soft timber. It's not hardwood, but. I'm thinking of Bitex parviflora, which is a beech forest species, which has very fast growth rates, by the way, but it's hard wood. You know? We call it tugas in, in the south, really, really hard wood. And yeah, I forgot to mention that it was used, it was not in the list, but it's one of the species used for the galleons also, because being very hard. So in general, um, the fast growers, they're not really hardwood species but uh so aglaya has uh soft wood yeah okay. yeah i think aglayas are also really important for like you know birds and stuff right so i can remember that hornbills really tend to like the fruits um so yet another reason to go and plant um <laughs> Aglaya all over Ilo Ilo. <laughs> Welcome the hornbills back to town. I mean, that'd be something. Birds. Yeah. Wow, I'm not sure there's a single hornbill left in Ilo Ilo, you know. Uh, I haven't heard of maybe in, in the north of the island, in Aklan. Oh, Peninsula, yeah. There's still yeah, there. where you have forest, but uh, I'm not sure about Ilo Ilo. It's just, it's just, you know. Ah, never mind. I think, but I think Cebu is worse than Iloilo. So, so, so. <laughs> I think I would believe you. <laughs> um, so we have. I think this this is the last question because I have a class coming uh, soon. <laughs> so uh, it's uh, from Abigail, and so it says, um, "Hello, Pa Doc Turgeon. I came in late, so I hope you don't mind telling again how the Iloilo tree returned." I would like to know if you were able to get a grasp of the habit of preference of the Ilu Ilu tree. The title was very catchy and I was looking forward to know that. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, basically uh, lower level, not exactly at the beach, but uh, within 100 meters above sea level. So that's uh, back of the beach to the rock, rocky cliffs. Yeah, that's that would be the habitat. Of, of the Ilu tree. Right, so it's a lowland um, forest tree or something. Maybe uh, if you get to Miss Dr. Panel, you can ask her where that 1,200 meters uh, came from because mm. it has not been... No, she's very, she's very responsive to uh, to emails, so we mm -hmm. could just uh, send her an email and uh, and ask her where that record came from. Yeah, mm -hmm. she might have a database with herbarium specimens that she viewed so that we can see um, if that is just really a weird outlier or mm -hmm. if um, yeah if there's more evidence pointing in the direction of a kind of larger ecological amplitude yep awesome so uh, I think that wraps up our
talk. A very interesting question and answer and talk uh, of Dr. Jurgen. So again, um, Dr. Jurgen, thank you very much for your time and sharing to us uh, the wonderful tree, the Iloilo tree, <laughs> um, Aglea um, Argentea. And yeah, Caroline, I, I've met Caroline when I was in China and sh whenever sh she looks at a tree that seems to look like Aglea, she would uh, take out her loop and would examine the hairs because that's, you know that's how the the distinction between the species um, were were designed. So, yeah, Peter uh, said uh, yeah, mentioned about that a while ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, again, I uh, thank you again. So uh, our next Zoominar would be in two weeks. So it will be a talk of David on Clair uh, Philippine clerodendron. So we hope to see you again uh, in our next Zoominar. So uh, I just for Yes. Just for one word, I will be remiss if I don't correct. They mm. are scales, uh, not hairs. Oh, maybe yeah, they're yeah. the same, but anyway, what I read, it, they are peltate scales. So I, I should, because somebody might come after me and say, ah, you're not doing it. They are peltate scales, uh, white and um, brownish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. they are. Uh, you, you completely the right, uh, Dr. Yogen. Um, every time I say the plants have hairs, people correct me. And they say, well, only uh, mammals have hairs. <laughs> and uh, they do come in all kinds of uh, different kinds in, uh, in Aglaia. Uh, peltate scales, stellate scales, um, uh, all kinds of different branches. And you need to look at the length of the, oh. of the, 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 the pointy bits. Uh, oh. It's complicated. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> So that makes sense. That's why Caroline also always brings her loop with her whenever we go like check trees. She would always like, you know, check the hairs. <laughs> okay, so uh, thanks again. And um, thanks again to our Facebook uh, viewers. And hopefully people on Facebook would be able to see that on YouTube. Um, so we will just post a record of this on, on Coast Digital Floor. I think it will remain there, the, the link that I posted there, it, it will remain there and it will record this whole thing. Yeah. So any last words, Peter, before we go? No, thank you all. Um, thank you, Doc Primavera. Excellent presentation, very inspiring. And I'll, I'll, I'll be in touch. Okay. Right. Okay. You're welcome so and bye-bye. See you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you, Dr. Jen.